we can make a positive film. What I'm concerned about um, is something uh, that P Peter Rock brought up earlier. Is this going to be just another documentary, another look at, let's look at the blacks in Northern Territory? I uh, let, stop. No, 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 hear me out, Nick, right? It's a concern that, that is there. I know that everyone's pushing for that not to happen, but it, it can very well lead that way. Um, if people don't want uh, individual footage of themselves in, in the film, then I think that should be optional for those individuals, not to say that all 20-odd people say we don't want to be in the film or whatever. But um, I don't want to be in the film. Why not? Because I don't want to be, like I said. I think it's a wide documentary. I think it's going to turn out that way. It's like uh, another version of the Bush Tucker man going through the Northern Territory. And I don't want to be a part of it, mate. This next band, set up by a, a brother of mine, the last time I saw him, he joined up with the army. He's come back, he's put a nine-piece band together called Jami. This is something that Richard has written, and Richard says, I'd write about what happened to us as a people, about sad things that should not have happened to anybody. Our people still die in jail. Our children still die of diseases that don't belong in Australia. But the main killer is society's attitude. Ignorance, lack of understanding, fear of another way of living, and lack of respect for us as a separate peoples and culture. Jeremy, give them a big hand. Day 1993, our first meeting with Richard Franklin's black and white band, Jambi, who were about to go on a tour of remote Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory. Richard wanted to promote his message of racial harmony across Australia, and he asked us, white filmmakers from Sydney, to make a film about the tour. After the concert, we went to Melbourne to meet the members of the band. Four of them were Koori. Alison Walker, one of the female vocalists. Peter Rottimer, the bass guitarist and former legal aid worker. Paul Wright, the dancer and didgeridoo player. And finally, back at band headquarters, where last minute preparations were underway, the driving force behind the tour, singer-songwriter Richard Franklin. Greetings. Greetings. Richard, what's happening? Oh, we're just having a little National White Week out here in the backyard. Come and join us. Be nice to a white week. Be nice to a white week, yeah. Kiss an invader, make them feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, on a very tight budget, we're sort of heading north and hoping that, um, We've got enough money to cover everything. Um, I mean, if it really boils down to it, we can always sell off one of the band members. I mean, I think we got two packets of smokes last time we sold a white fella up that way, but... Um, <laughs> and Waddy Waddy to say so, Eugene. <laughs> there were five white people in the band. Eugene Ball, the trumpet player. Julian Wilson, the sax player. Julia Messenger, the other female vocalist. Peter Pascotto, the drummer and Peter Baylor, the lead guitarist. There were the three roadies, Frank Cleary and Chris and Bluey. And then there were the two young offenders Richard wanted to take along on the trip for some work experience. They're good fellas. Um, I know both of them. Um, and I reckon, that, uh, I reckon that they can get a lot out of it. Um, and I think that we can get a lot out of it. Leon. That's a, that's a young lad that knocked my car off down Lake Tyres. <laughs> uh, I come in here for cars, theft and burgs, and got transferred down to Poplar House. 
than a god island month. Come on to my life. So with the band, the film crew, and all the associated extras, we were 23 people. We set off wondering how each individual would react to the trip and what their expectations were. In our minds were some of the things we'd been told in Melbourne, and we realized how significant this trip was going to be, particularly for the Koori members of the band. In Victoria, we're very sort of emotional, we're very sort of spiritual, a lot of us are, but we don't know you know, any identifiable culture, such as our dance, such as our languages, and it's very tragic. Scotty, white man. We grew up with the um, ways where the white man used to tell us we can't go hunting, you can't go practicing your culture, you can't practice your law, you can't talk language, because to them it was forbidden because they wanted us to be like them. It's good to see the Northern Aboriginals. They've still got a lot of their culture, which we've lost. Because we've been in contact with the white culture longer, and she's just looking at me, my mum's English, and we're a lot lighter than them in colour and that. I suppose they, they get a shock when you say that you're Koori or one of them. You know. uh, the heaps of Aboriginals up there. It'd be good for me to go up there. So when I come back to Poplar House, I'll get trust. Men of different religions. Atlanta ships sailing out across the seas. Come on to my land. Come on to my people. I'm not sure how they received me as a white person, considering the injustices that have been done upon the Aboriginals by white people. I hope that they can receive me well, but I can understand if they can't, yeah. We're gonna find the result of white man's impact on this country, and I think it's going to be quite different being there rather than, say, watching it on 7.30 report or Four Corners. We're gonna be there, and that's gonna be very confronting. It was a long, rough journey to our first stop at Papunya, and we arrived at dusk. Our contact, Sid Anderson, had gone off to a funeral, and nobody was expecting us. In the morning, the band awoke to their first impressions of the community. Well. Here we are, this is the third day into the tour, and this is the first community that we've managed to uh, come to. It's called Papunya, and I've heard it pronounced two ways, uh, Papunya and Papunya. We're in Papunya, and um, the compound, the school is just over there, and the community hall is just around the corner there, that's where we're playing tonight. It's a bit boomy. Uh, we need about a hundred people to sort of dampen the sound or else it's going to be a big blamange of sound. Papunya felt like a different world. Because the community was worried about negative images in the media, we were asked not to film outside the compound where we were staying. But even from here, we could get a sense of what the community was like. And the poor living standards were beginning to affect the band strongly. Leon seemed to want to stay hidden in the bus, while Chris was so filled with a desire to help that he started to repair the broken playground equipment. Oh, I used to work around this area about 75 to 77, and this place hasn't changed one bit since that time, even though the government says that they're doing a lot for Koori communities around the place. Uh, I haven't seen any changes. I asked Peter why there were restrictions on our filming. The media portrays the positive thing on tourism, the negative things on drunkenness and uh, you know uh, uh, all those issues. You know? They don't show what effects European colonisation has had on our community. I'm finding the conditions um, of the place pretty poor around here. Like um, 
it's, it's really, I, I feel quite guilty, <laughs> actually, as a white person, yeah, having to, to look at all this. <laughs> I guess one of the most disturbing things, uh, being a Koori from down south, is the feeling of helplessness that you get, but you're not sure what you can do to help. And you just hope that what we're doing, bringing a black and white urban band through here, is going to help, and it's going to do something positive. And maybe leave a message that, uh, that changing attitudes can work. That'll do. That afternoon, the band gave the kids a music lesson. It looked like there wouldn't be a proper concert that night because most of the community seemed to have gone away with Sid to the funeral. Recently in this community, um, a person has died with the same name as myself and two other members of the band. And uh, out of respect, they don't say that person's name for a long time. Or any person that has the same name as that person who's died has to be called Kumanjay. It was sort of, it was an honour actually to be called another name on, upon arrival. What it means is no name, Kuman J. So I don't have a name. So I don't have to answer to anything anymore. I have to... I'm a different person, you know. <laughs> Kuman J, how does it feel to have a new name? Well, I'm sorry. I can't do this at the moment. I'm sorry. Why is that? I feel a bit nervous, actually. Yeah, I've just clammed up for the camera. What do you feel nervous about? I'm not sure. It must be just start uh, stage though, I think. Bye. 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 Huh? Bye. 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 Hello. You take me over the hand. Peter, do you know what he's saying? Can you tell me? I, I can't quite understand it, no. Do you have any idea? I think he said there are a lot of people here, but I'm not sure. With the clouds building up outside, we went to look for Alison. We found her watching a group of women painting themselves in preparation for a dance. That was, a, that was an amazing experience. Oh, um, just the fact I got to sit there with women elders and share that with them. Um, and it was something like I'd look for with my people, but I can't have. So I'll get to share it with them. The women were soon to go on a trip to Melbourne where they would perform their dance. They did a special rehearsal for the band. When I first saw uh, Papanya when we rolled up there and it was raining, and I thought, oh, no, this is as bad as I thought. This is terrible, you know. And um, and it was just, I just, I guess I was so sort of surprised at how quickly I thought nothing of the the surroundings and just thought, oh, here are the people. And in spite of everything, their spirit seems to be shining through. And uh, I guess I've just been overwhelmed by the friendliness and the openness. As the dance ended, the rain began to fall again. Having expected the desert to be hot and dry, it was turning out to be cold and wet. Not wanting to get cut off in Papunya as the desert roads became flooded, it was decided we should leave immediately for Uendamu. Oh, can't you see? Oh, can't you see? We can make it if we try. Put back the children, don't you take away those lies. Put back the children, we can make it if we try. Put back the children, don't you take away those lies. Put back the children, we can make it if we try. Put back the children, don't you take away those lies. Put back the children, we can make it if we try. 
Put back the children, don't you take away those lives. Put back the children, we can make it if we try. Oh, I got the children, don't you take away those lives. Put back the children, we can make it if we try. I can do it, oh, I can do it, and it's in my hand. By the time the unloading began at Uendamu, the rain had stopped and the desert sun was shrinking the floods into muddy puddles. Excited at the prospect of a full-scale concert, the band struggled to get their five tons of equipment into the hall. With the truck emptied, Hawley disappeared out bush and the others began to branch out into the community. Again, we had been asked to film only in certain areas and this made it hard for us to keep a track on all that was going on. We were going to have to rely on Richard to keep us in touch with some of the things that were happening. The Jambi poster is all possum skins representing different clans and uh, because uh, Buddy Stewart is dreaming his possum dreaming, which is all the hills in the background. Yeah. Um, I gave him these because I thought it would be something special to give him. And um, I was telling him how we haven't got much language uh, left down home. <laughs> and how um, this, this particular design comes from uh, one of the last remaining possum skins. Hey, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Last time we had a decent yarn, we were in, Yun, in Papania, and from there we went up to Yundamu, where um, I met this bloke called Gordon Robertson, who's one of the greatest songwriters I've ever met, and he's with a band called Black Storm. And the desert keeps on crying. Richard, what have you been doing today? Well, Gordon and I, um, we just started yarning away and having a bit of a talk and, um, and uh, wrote four songs. We wrote one right here and then we went out the bush off the back over there and um, sat down in the dirt and desert and wrote, wrote them. As the day drew on and Frank set up for the concert, Paulie returned from the bush Oh, wow. Yeah. Right at the, right at the station. Took me. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, where have you been? Oh. Seagood. Seagood. Seagood place. Sir. 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 What? How do you feel about doing that? Real strong, real spiritual. Real happy, proud, proud to be black, you know, proud to be an Aboriginal, be part of this land, you know, because it's something that we all should experience as strongly here, and it'd be good to learn from me and take it back home to Victoria. This magic is just all excited, you know, it's one of those things there. Better than the pub getting drunk, you know, one of those things. You, know, you don't need nothing to get your eyes, just natural eyes.
what's really important too is seeing black and white people on stage together. I think it's a part of the whole process of making Australia a, a better place. And you know, it's only done because of the courage of the black and white members of the band in standing up and saying, you know, well, we're not ashamed to be up here together. You know, we see it as a thing of pride. What's it like for you coming up here then? Education, that's a good education, because being from Victoria, as I was growing up, you only hear about traditional people on TV and, and that. What I see up here is strong. And when I go back home, there's nothing because all that people just talk, 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 talk about being an Aboriginal. But to be an Aboriginal, you've got to live like one. And to live like one, you've got to have that proper understanding of bush gathering, Tucker, going out hunting, telling stories to your children, your language, and, and doing all that. What's it like being Aboriginal in Victoria? Uh, it's no good. You can't go out hunting can't can't do nothing man because you always got the police watching you like if something go wrong in more well cops go straight to me and i'll get the blame for it they would just grab me handcuff me take me back to the police station and chuck me in the cells can't do nothing about it so if somebody breaks a law like especially the white man's law and the first thing the white man does is punish them by locking them up. And that's no good because it's out of sight, out of mind. With Aboriginal culture and law, they'd get flogged, or they might get one of these ones, spear, or they might get a boomerang, or they might get a bundi, you know, get a flogging. That's in our ways. If you murder someone by an accident, you're going to face the law. They're going to come and stab you. They lead you to the oval, you gotta be there by yourself with your shorts on. Not trousers, oh no, sorry, not shirt, only with trousers on. You'll be facing about, looking at 150 people, five many trees. They're gonna spear you. They'll crack the big null on from there right up. Crack your head in, make 100 splits. Come on from this land. Doesn't matter it if, if they crack your brains out. Understand. Till every individual person's finished. Your business is finished. You won't take, you won't go to the sales for doing as a murder, murder charge. You won't, you won't do that. Leon, he, he copped a flog because he stole my car. I was going to spear him, but um, I never had a spear, so. But what happens though in Victoria if you spear someone? Well, what's going to happen? Well, I can't say because it hasn't happened for a long, long time, so I want to be the first one to, to bring that law back and see what happens, and I want to challenge that white man in the courts. What happens up here if that happens? The white men don't do nothing. They can't do nothing because that's traditional.
Oh, good. Yeah. Had a good time. Um, not very much clapping, but I, I can understand that. But uh, I, I've got a new dance up here. I'm sure it's a, it'd be a craze anywhere if it ever gets out of here, you know? Can you, can you just show us what the dance is like? No way. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to move like those people. Just no a way. little bit, just to give us an idea. <laughs> There's no way in the world you're going to get me to dance. <laughs> No way, Jose. <laughs> Ain't no need for fighting. You won't cry no more. Time. Listen, my sister. Together we are one. Let us burn out the last one. Indigenous white people over there. In order to avoid getting bogged, Frank took the big truck on a different road to Tennant Creek. We found him at the swimming pool. Frank, do you always unload like this? Um, not, not, not on quite such an angle. Uh, <laughs> we were actually planning to back the truck in. That's what we're in the process of doing when it decides to bog itself. So we're going back the truck into here and just basically load it out straight onto the stage area where we're working. What do you mean from itself? Um, we'd moved about two feet backwards and it just dropped. And there was no wheel spinning or anything, it just sunk. <laughs> Alison, what are you doing? Just, um, just writing down my thoughts of the truth and the feelings of the truth. What are those? Uh, sort of, um, basically about their cultures and mine, really. How, I suppose the biggest shock was at Rapunia for me. I suppose. I, I thought I come here thinking that I have something in common with them as my past, my, my people. And but then I stood there amongst the, all those people there, the Panya and Yindamu. And I suppose I felt I had nothing at all. It's, there's a big identity crisis that happens with people. I mean, it's like, it is like being in two worlds. And I sort of see our role down south as um, not necessarily teaching anybody up here anything, but at least making them aware of, of what, what can happen if they lose their language and... and much of their culture. That night I felt strange. I felt like I was a white girl looking at a different race of people, even though I'm not. 
I guess I was looking on this trip to try and capture a past of mine that is nearly extinct, but I can't. They are a different nation to mine. Their land is different. Their language is different. I am the colour of a white man. My values, thinking and beliefs are those of a white person. For once in my life, I felt ashamed of who I am. A Heinz variety is no longer a joke. I rather wish I were a full blood of some race. I sat there feeling the lowest scum of all. I was getting hot. So when it starts getting smoking, you know that yeah, ready, that ready yeah, ash is getting warm. Mm. And what you've got to do is pick him up slowly. And, 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 what does it feel like for you being part Aboriginal? I identify as Aboriginal. I don't say that I'm part. I mean, you know, my father was um, white, but um, I'm not white. But I've lived in both worlds. I've, I've seen the white world, and um, I feel sorry for them. I feel more pity th for them than for my own people because my own people still got um, a spiritual side type of thing. G'day, two bucks, thanks. That night, there was the concert at the Tennant Creek swimming pool. This was to be the largest concert on the tour, one that everyone had been looking forward to. Some going up called Malcolm Smith. <laughs> Was it true? Was my Christmas? Was it really just what it took? Was it for you to get by? Was the system that took his life? How did he die? Did he need to go for a cry? No good. Just got like a big black bar, feathers in my last cousin loves his time. Leaves me cut and say hey back. Like you look good, now this hurt. away and all of a sudden the power sort of just went off and here we are sort of like by the pool there's no power anywhere I don't know where it went <laughs> we think Frank knows who took it he's gone to look for it <laughs> I think it was the irate neighbour across the road it's a pretty big setup. I think it's just plugged into the wall over there I think 10 pieces is too much for 10 pieces no it's a PA oh, it's Frank going <laughs> pushing as much out of his possible <laughs> I think everyone's pretty understanding. I think things like this must happen in the territory a bit. Pretty good record though. What is it? Three breakdowns, one bog, one gig that was more or less wasn't a gig because of sorry business, and this one. So, but I think things are going to get better. <laughs> they can't get any bloody worse. <laughs> I feel good out here. I feel very nice. At the outside, you've got a lot of freedom. 
got the bush. At our camp the next day, Peter Rottimer played one of his songs. He had told us before that he didn't want his music included in the film, but we never understood the reason why. Another song, alright. Desperado. <laughs> I asked him again if he would explain himself. Why don't you want your music included? <coughs> it's my business. I've told you that before. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you ought to be a detective, you know, Nick. You ought to be a detective. You're still trying to pray, aren't you? You're still trying to pray, aren't you? You're still trying to pray, aren't you? Very good, very good. I like that in a man. <laughs> Later the same day, Alison and Julia were taken by some women elders to a special women's dreaming site. Thoughts go to my own Nana Walker. Traditional women's business was taken from her. Her own mother, Nanny Egan, said that it's best she doesn't know. When Nanny Egan was lowered into the ground, my only chance of learning our culture was buried with her. At least there are women elders of the north I can learn women's business from. And that would be an airband, correct? Airband. Oh, we had bands. Yeah, that was singing over there. And that would say stuff about everything. And dancing. Selling glass and everything. And I felt like they'd be looking down on me as um, half caste and quarter caste business. Yeah. Maybe it's just me, you know, thinking like, like that they wouldn't accept me. Yeah, it's so different in Melbourne. There's blondes and blue eyes that are cooey. There's the stereotype that the only Aboriginal is a, an Aboriginal up north out the bush painted up and standing there on one leg. And that, that's one which in Victoria we, we come into conflict with every, every day. And, um, you know, people say, oh, oh, but you're not really black, you're one of us. Um, I'm not white. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. I mean, it's, it's hard for me sometimes um, when some Koreas think that I'm white. That makes me warm. What about Mexican? Mexican, Mexican, it's hard when they think I'm Mexican too. This is Sydney, isn't it? No! Oh. Where are we? You just knocked some of my hair off. Bad girls are loud, big fan. I heard that they're real good dancers in Sydney. I don't know what you Barunga might have liked. Are you good dancers? Yeah. Okay, here we go. A song called Driving. As we got closer to Catherine, we found out that Paulie 
had an adopted family who were some of the traditional owners of Catherine Gorge. But what Paul is trying to get at everybody's head, because he's trying to follow <coughs> traditional ways, he feels that it's up to him to get his parents and for nobody in this tour to turn around and congregate on Catherine Gorge until his mother as an elder turns around and says so. I don't think it'll be a problem for us. To get Tradition and respect demanded that Paulie leave the band and go on ahead to spend time with his family. This began to create some conflicts. I thought it'd be nice to ask for permission so we can all go there and hear the Dreamtime stories and that from, from the local local people, my mum and the rest of the mob. What we're trying to do is make arrangements for Paulie to get into Catherine. Um, and the difficult thing is the time frame for him to be able to get in there and, and have the time to spend with his family. So why don't you go now? Uh, well, because I've got to come back tonight for the gig performance. But, um... In a respective way, I'd rather spend the whole day with my mother and night instead of just yeah. a couple of hours and then come back and, and not see her again for a couple of days, you know, because it's not right. Well, it's, it's difficult for us as a unit. Um, the situation is because as a unit, we've got a commitment to uh, the Barunga and now the Beswick community um, to do a show. And that show includes, um, an integral part of that show is dish playing. What about your commitment to the band then? Well, that's what I'm saying. That's why I can't go. Because I'm on a so-called white man's contract. Yeah. And to me, that's... Well, I signed it, so, you know, I'm going to stick by it. Culturally, he's... He's, uh... He's been adopted by the family up there. And that's his family. And, um... It's hurting him because he can't get there. He wants to get there and pay respect to them. Which is, is also right. I mean, I'm, I'm hurting too, seeing Paulie hurt. See, I want to do things traditionally. The way my ancestors taught us for thousands of years and kept that same way over and over and over. How does Richard want to do it? Well, yeah, it's <laughs> on schedules. You know, you've got a commitment, contracts. Is that That's a it. conflict between you two? No, it's no conflict, it's just a... It's a different method, yes, different ways, a white man's ways, traditional ways. What we've sort of seen, seen here and, and, and just within, within our group here, within the band, is, is, is people like, like, like Peter Rott and, and Paulie really struggling to cope with, with their situations. And this is, this is just a constant reminder of what they're really up against. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I just don't, I really don't envy them, and yet, and in a sense, I, I do envy them because, um, um, at least to have that dilemma, um, means that, that, you know, there's something more, there's something more there that's worth hanging on to. That night, Paulie decided he had to go off and see his family. At the concert, David Bernati, an elder from the Beswick community, played the didgeridoo in Paulie's place. Why is a warrior now? Someone who fights for the truth. When we caught up with Paulie and Catherine two days later, we went on a trip to the gorge. But to Paulie's dismay, the only way you could get to see the gorge was on a tourist boat. A set of paintings up here is what's known as a hunter-gatherer group of paintings done in the red ochre. The Aboriginal people used to use four colours, being a red and yellow ochre, which the oxides found throughout the gorge system, and the white is clay and the black is charcoal. Now, once they had everything together, they'd bring it back to an area like this. I felt guilt as I thought of their culture being like tourist material. I felt that more and more what was sacred is getting more public and the people of the North's culture is just one money-making show. At the beginning of the trip, I had much anger to what my people have lost. But I belong to a proud race and I'm proud to be an Aboriginal. Sure, I'm still hurt at what was taken away from us culturally, 
but it's made me more determined to look for what culture of mine is left and impart that to others. All through the tour, our expectations of the concerts had been mixed, but I think we'd all expected bigger crowds, if not a more regular type of venue. In order to try and please those who did come, the band started to play different music. The audience was happy enough, but it didn't really solve any problems. And so the band quickly went back to playing their own music. at Borolula was pretty good, but by this stage we were in the wild rain and humidity of the far north, and everyone had just about had enough. Borolula was, I felt really down there because I uh, just running around in mud puddles all day sort of just made me just depressed but because the environment is just feeding us all the time. Everyone's probably just sick of packing up and leaving camp every, you know, two, three days. Sick of sitting around. Sick of each other, I suppose. We were nearly at the end of the tour, and all the problems suddenly came to a head. There had been various disagreements from the beginning, and now all these became focused in a dramatic split between ourselves and the band. Basically, this meeting is up because people have concerns. The floor is open for those who want to um, raise their hands and bring up any concerns. I want to know what's going on with the band. I want to stop pretending that everything is rosy and find out what's really happening. I want to know why it is that, that I get threatened when I walk into Mataranka Springs. I want to know why. Because I think this thing stinks, all right? I think your attitude towards the whole lot stinks, and I don't want to be in the film. Why not? Because I don't want to be, like I said. I think it's a white documentary. I think it's going to turn out that way. It's like uh, another version of the Bush Tucker man going through the Northern Territory. And I don't want to be a part of it, mate. So you're saying that basically you just shouldn't be making the film and that's it? Yeah. You know, if you're looking at Aboriginal cultural issues, it's going to take you more than two weeks. It's been like that for 200 years and you probably still haven't learned shush, enough. Shush, shush. It's going to take you more than two weeks. I'm talking more than bloody three weeks. You're only in this bloody area just for a little while and then you're off doing other bloody things. It's all right for you. You go off and you make another film. You go back to your, your life, <clears throat> which is the middle class white life. You haven't got your whole background, which has been torn apart. Like I say, if you want to do something properly, you've got to be in there for 10 odd years before you can start even think about getting proper issues out. Peter, wouldn't you think that three weeks is better than no weeks at all? I mean, no. don't... Look, it's just going to be the same as any other documentary, like I say. No, I'm well, talking about, about your other Richard, why he, why he wanted to make the film in the first place. Well, My objective with this film was to make a, a positive film about Kuris, because there's never been one, or about Aboriginal people, never been one made that shows 
the love, the warmth and the respect that is in the community. I, I just see that you and Peter are talking about two different films. You want something that's going to show the plight of the Aboriginal people. You don't want a film about this band coming through and sort of, you know, the Partridge family goes Koori. And so I want to know what your criticisms are based on in terms of the making of this. The thing is, you know, we've been through a hell of a lot of repression and this is what you've got to realise. Okay? Oh, this is that. what you've got to realise too. Realize now listen, all right? And if we, I, I tend to go off my block because I've been working in organisations for 20 odd years. I've seen the shit that you might put down. And when I see a documentary that's been like any other documentary going through, I don't care if we were with a band or not, I know the underlying reason. And if I see them going off the, uh, off the track a bit, I'll go off my block. I don't give a fuck who's in the road. So you just watch it. Nothing was resolved, and it was with the split growing wider that we all continued on to the end of the tour and the final concert in Darwin. again. Um, it's the end of the tour. We just finished our last gig last night in Darwin. From Borrelula we, um, well, we had a great time and I think that was the last time I spoke to you. We went from there down to Barunga where we met up with this bloke. This is Shane Angel. He's the new road manager for Jambi and uh, I think when you look at the tour overall I think that, um, that we achieved um, a lot. I don't know whether we achieved what we set out to achieve. I'm not even sure what we set out to achieve. Maybe just to do a few gigs and that. And um, if we could have captured all the good things on film, I think um, White Australia would have been um, really touched by what they would have seen. And maybe they still would be. Come on, everybody. We're all part of the one crew. Yeah, we're all a crew. <laughs> 